Hello and welcome. I am Scrapperlock and this is Call of Cthulhu, solo gameplay. We are currently playing a character named Daniel, who is involved in the starter set solo adventure called Alone Against the Flames. This is sort of like a choose your own adventure where we make decisions and roll on our character's stats. In the previous episode, our character left his hometown headed for Arkham. Daniel is a medical doctor and is taking up a medical post at the hospital in Arkham, Massachusetts. He took a bus and the bus almost got into an accident but narrowly avoided it. And then we got to a small town named Emberhead just as the bus broke down. The bus driver suggested that we might board at a house uh, owned by someone named May Ledbetter. And we went to May's house. We met May's daughter, Ruth, very briefly, who's 10 years old. And then we went to sleep in the spare room, which she gave us a good rate on renting. And so now we're going to continue after having fallen asleep without lighting the fire on the grate. You dream of fire in the grate. Coruscating colors shimmer through the dancing tongues of flame. At first, they are tiny, almost microscopic, but they grow and grow until a kaleidoscopic inferno spills from the fireplace, spreading across the, across the floor and up the sheets. You wake with a start. Daylight glints through the curtains. You get up and examine the grate, blinking the sleep from your eyes. It is quite cold. If you have taken any damage, it says you may heal up one point from the night's sleep, but we didn't take any damage, so we are fine. We have 11 hit points. May seems to have no running water, but has supplied some in a ceramic jug. You freshen up at the washstand and go in. She cooks a hearty breakfast and leaves you in peace to eat. At about 7.30... You are paid up, packed, and ready to go. You bid May goodbye, and she wishes you the best for your new career. It now tells us that if we succeeded at a skill check the previous night, we can investigate further, but we didn't make a skill check, so we're going to move on. You are already tired of your heavy bags. Hopefully Silas has repaired the motor coach, and you can resume your long journey. A sourpuss he might be, but the old driver seemed to understand his vehicle well enough. You pause to check your watch, still 20 minutes early, and round the final corner. The motor coach is gone. You put your bags down and search the area, trekking up and down the slopes and around the corners. At the edge of the village, you trace the long road back as it winds across the heights, uh, the hills. Eight o'clock comes and goes. There's no coach to be seen. A passing villager notices you and your bags. Looking for the bus? I heard him take off at first light. He's due back in three or four days. If you need a place to stay, May Ledbetter rents a room. The man raises his hat to you and strolls on into the village. You curse Silas under your breath. Perhaps he went for parts, but you wonder if the old goat has stranded you here on purpose. May is doing laundry and looks surprised to see you again. Forget something? When you explain the situation, she offers to store your bags while you try to arrange alternative transport. You are grateful to relinquish the load. Nobody here has anything like a car. She strokes her chin and narrows her eyes. Maybe you could find somebody with a horse and a cart for your bags? I could ask around later. Try Mr. Winters at the Village Hall. He'll know if anyone will. Or ask among the artisans. Their workshops are first left on Silbury Street. She reaches over and squeezes your wrist. Don't worry. I won't see you sleeping in the street. Money or no money. You thank May. And turn to face the village. You wander the streets of Emberhead without any particular destination in mind. The village is built on a relatively flat upland with splendid views. To the north, the hazy tips of the white mountains reach for the heavens. To the south, the sparkling waters of Lake 
Winnipesaukee touch the horizon. The village itself takes less than five minutes to cross from edge to edge. You arrived on the winding road to the west, the only other road leaves to the south, following a lower ridge of land as it turns east. In the southwest of the village, an open grassy space borders a ruined church, its graveyard cresting the cliffs. To the northeast, the three main thoroughfares meet at a raised black metal structure. It looms stark against the blue sky. We now have the following choices. We can ask about transport at the local general store. We can seek out the village hall. We can walk down the lower level and check out the eastern road. We can examine the large metal structure. We can explore the church. We can look for local people with their own transport needs. I want to know what this large metal structure is, so let's go take a look. You walk up the approach, the most central of the village's major streets. It points directly at the odd metal structure. As you emerge from the shade of the nearby buildings, you are greeted by a magnificent panorama spread from the north to the southeast. The last colors of fall tint the hills a sleepy gold. The structure, by contrast, is made from uncompromising iron, singed black. It supports an immense curved platform at the level of your head. Further struts snake up to a central point. It looks like they may have been some kind of sculpture at one point, but now they're twisted and melted beyond any recognition. An older gentleman passes, looking up at you with roomy eyes. Are you here for the festival? he asks. That's the beacon. They light it. Night after next, and you'll be able to see ten miles away. He gives a little nod of satisfaction, then moves on, leaning on his walking stick. Now you notice the bundles of wood tied and stacked against the buildings nearby. Perhaps the festival would be an interesting diversion, but you really must head to Arkham as soon as possible. Now we get a chance to make a spot hidden roll, so let's see if we succeed. Our spot hidden is 50, so we have a 50-50 chance. A roll of 37, so we succeeded at the spot hidden. As you walk away from the iron structure, you notice something strange about the construction of the village. All the wooden dwellings are concentrated in the west and southwest. To the east and northeast, closest to the beacon, the buildings are formed from dark brick and clay. Does this mean the settlement began at the beacon and spread west? We now get to mark the little box behind, be, beside our spot hidden. That means we have succeeded at the skill, so if we live through this adventure, I guess, we get a chance to raise our skill. You are beginning to get your bearings in Emberhead. Would you like to explore some more? So we can try up to four options, I believe. Um, and so we have five or six here. We can ask about transport. We can seek out the village hall. We can walk down to the lower level and check out the eastern road. We can examine the large metal structure. We already did that. We can explore the church or we can look for local people. Let's check out the church. You cross the street towards the church. As you glance to your left, your gaze alights on the large metal structure. Something bothers you about its positioning. You back up and look again. Yes, Emberhead's central thoroughfare points directly at the structure. This seems too precise to be a coincidence. You press on and draw into the shadow of the church. The building is in a sorry state. The top of the steeple is missing. A ragged gash of splintered boards marks its absence, and the floor beneath it has collapsed. It appears to have torn through the roof of the main building as it fell. Only the back half is still intact. The white paint, which once covered the church, has yellowed and peeled. It seems safe enough to explore the rear section. Old pews are stacked against the wall, choked with mildew. Most of the windows are broken. You guess 
this church has been disused for about 20 years. There's little more to interest you. Then it says to make a ride roll, we may have a bonus die roll. The tens percentage die is rolled twice, and we take the lowest. So we're going to roll two tens, two, two tens and one ones die. And we get a 50 and a 30 on the tens, so we take our 30 and add a 4 on the ones die, so we have a 34 score to ride. Our ride roll is 5%, so we failed the ride roll. Um, not sure what that would have done for us, but okay. We get to explore four more things. Um, three, two more things, actually. Uh, we can go to the village hall, walk down to the eastern road, or ask for transport. Let's go to the village hall, and then we'll ask about transport. The village hall backs against a cliff at the east end of Silbury Street. It's the largest building you've seen so far in Emberhead. It is, however, locked and shuttered. You walk around it, peering through gaps in the shutters. There seems to be one large room, presumably for community meetings, and a smaller annex that serves as an office and archive. One of the windows is bricked up. Back at the main door, you can see no posted opening hours. Mr. Winters doesn't open up mornings this time of year, says a gray-garbed woman passing by. Best come back this afternoon. You ask whether the office has a telegraph. Don't know, she shrugs. Who would we call? You will have to try again later. So now um, we can look for local, ask local people for transport or ask about transport at the general store. So let's go to the general store. The general store is on a corner beside the main road just before it plunges to the south. The shopkeeper is a brisk, immense lady with a starched apron and long shoulders. She looks hard at your unfamiliar face. Transport? There's a motor coach comes through twice a week. Missed it, hmm? Truck brings in my supplies every second Tuesday, but he's not due till next week. She shrugs. It seems Emberhead is content to keep its distance from the outside world. We have enough money to buy one or two inexpensive everyday items, which we can note down. Remember, the year is 1927, and the shop doesn't stock any weapons except a dusty hunting knife, which you may purchase if you want. So I think we're going to take the dusty hunting knife, which I will now note down on my character sheet. And we're also going to buy a can of tuna fish for food. I'm sure they had canned tuna fish back then. I'm not going to look that up. I think they did. So we've now done all of our investigating and we're going to move on. Your morning exertions have left you hungry. You roam the streets of Emberhead looking for sustenance. Of course, I have a can of tuna fish, but we'll save that for later. There's nothing resembling the busy cafes of your hometown or anything that might be called a restaurant. It is beginning to look like you will have to get supplies from the general store. We already did that. When May Ledbetter comes down the street with a girl trailing in her wake. This must be Ruth. As she notices you, she races past her mother and approaches you with a smile. This is a different Ruth from the shy creature you met last night. As she reaches you, she stops and stretches her arms up in celebration. She looks up into your eyes. Abruptly, the smile drops from her face, and she looks several years older. Get out before the festival! She hisses, get out! She blinks hard, then scuttles back towards her mother. May approaches, wrapping an arm around her daughter's shoulders. She smiles. How are you getting on? Have you found transport? Startled, you explain your frustrations of your situation. I'd try Mr. Winters in the village hall. He's always in of an afternoon. You'll be hungry by now. Help yourself to any food in the house. It's not locked. You glance at Ruth, where she has scrawled herself behind her mother's legs. Her eyes implore you to silence. So now we can ask Ruth about what she said. We can ask May about what Ruth said, or we can say nothing. Well, she's telling us to be silent, so I'm going to say nothing. You take your leave of the Ledbetters and head towards their house. The door opens easily in the low kitchen. You make a meal from stodgy bread and leftover stew. A little window offers a view of the mountains. If you learned one thing this morning, it was that Emberhead streets hold little to occupy the visitor 
out of t from out of town. But there are still about five hours of daylight remaining. You could take some provisions and the bare essentials from your luggage and set out in the hope of reaching another settlement before dark, or you could ask for advice from this Mint Mr. Winters. Let's go back to the village hall and ask Mr. Winters. The village hall overlooks the lower north ridge of the village. You walk along Silbury Street to find it, conscious of the oppressive black metal structure framed at the end of the road. The shutters of the hall are all open and some windows left ajar. There's no knocker, but a little bell over the entrance tinkles as you push in the front door. Inside, a sturdy door to your right is marked private. To your left, an opening leads through to a bright room. You take a few steps inside, benches line the walls, and there are two notice boards mounted between the windows. Let's examine the notice boards. The floorboards creak beneath you as you cross the room. You feel a slight spring in your step. Perhaps this room is used as a gymnasium for the village children. One notice board appears to be for the adults of the community and one for the children. The former looks neglected, featuring handwritten advertisements for household items and a yellowed note about telegraph pricing. There is nothing about the festival. The children's notice board has a schedule for weekly services, a number of paintings obviously done by the children themselves. Most are incoherent, though colorful. As best you can tell, they depict fireworks, or perhaps the tale of Joseph from the book of Genesis. One has lost a pin and hangs upside down. It shows a giant bird attacking Emberhead, or it might simply be that the artist has not yet mastered the subtleties of scale. And now we get a chance to make a spot hidden roll again. Remember Daniel, our character, has a spot hidden of 50. And we've already succeeded at it once, so additional successes won't increase our chance to increase the skill. We get a 13, so we spotted hidden. Not only do we do it, but we get a hard success on that one. I don't think that matters here. As the afternoon sun hits the floor, you notice something curious. The boards under the window are newer than the boards in the center of the floor. The frames also show signs of having been replaced in the recent past. Perhaps rain? leaked in and rotted the wood. The door behind you scrapes open. A middle-aged, bespectacled gentleman appears in the doorway. May I help you? You explain that you are visiting on May Ledbetter's recommendation. Ah, well, I'm Clyde Winters. I'm not sure I can help you, but would you care for some coffee? I'm partial to a cup in the afternoon. He gestures to the open door behind him. This seems like a worthwhile opportunity and you are a little thirsty. You step through the door marked private. The other side of the village hall is in marked contrast to the public space. This room is compact, lined with shelves of books and file alcoves. One corner is reserved for a tiny pantry and what is presumably the water closet. You, <coughs> you study Mr. Winters as he fills the percolator. Although thin on top, his hair is oiled and neatly swept back. His suit is a sober affair and well tailored, even if the cut is a little old fashioned. A lesser man working alone might have loosened his bow tie for comfort. On the desk against the opposite wall, you notice what looks like a telegraph set. To ask about the telegraph immediately, or we can make small talk. Let's ask immediately. The telegraph, hmm. Much as we value our isolation, we do need the link sometimes. You were hoping to send a message? I must apologize. The line has been down for two weeks. I reported the fault, but of course they're not so speedy when the problem lies in a rural area. I'm expecting a repa repair in the next day or two. I do appreciate how frustrating this must be. The coach is due in, what, three days? But I think he's going west. Perhaps you might engage a wagon? One of the farmers might. You explain that you've asked a few of the residents already, but to no avail. I'll tell you what. Winters pours you a steaming cup of coffee. The dark liquid smells rich and strong. When the repair crew arrive, I'll ask them to take you back with them. How would that be? They might want a dollar or two to grease the wheels. The day after tomorrow, that's less than ideal. But 
it's the first real opportunity you've had. So now we can thank him and leave or ask about his library. Let's ask. You make a small but flattering remark about a couple of the volumes on the shelves. Winters blushes with pleasure. Well, of course, they're not my personal collection. They belong to the village, he says. But I did select most of the items. This is the community's library, you see. I put up the private sign to stop people just wandering from meetings in the other room. But this really is a public space. You scan the shelves. There is a sparse but respectable collection on mathematics and the sciences, passable sections on history and art, and a shelf of literature. He has a few lowbrow novels tucked away in a corner with tatty copies of Bizarre Tales magazine. Quality does not always equate to popularity, I'm afraid. Winters gives you an apologetic smile. So now we can take the time for some research in the library or leave while it's light outside. Let's take the time to do some research. Winters is happy for you to spend the rest of the afternoon in the study and offers you an upright and comfortable chair. You have enough time to pursue one line of research in depth. Our choices are the history of the area, the festival, something from the sciences, or weird fiction. I think we want to learn about this weird festival. You are not surprised to find there is no published work on Emberhead's festival. Winters pokes around and finds a cased monograph handwritten on yellowing paper by a Dr. Anielowski. An acquaintance of my father's, I believe, Winters says. The manuscript is somewhat difficult to read, and you make slow progress. Anielowski speculates that the festival has its origin in pagan rites brought over by Celtic settlers, which celebrate the ancient festivals of Beltane, Semhun, Imbolc, and Lugnasad. There is some discussion of the struggle between the seasons and a couple of oblique references to the alignment in Emberhead. And Ialowski suggests that the meaning of the festival slowly changed around the turn of the century. The monograph terminates mid-sentence at the end of page 28, just as it begins to discuss the modern practices. You ask Winters if he has the remaining pages. No, I'm afraid those have been misplaced, he says. Perhaps they are still in the library somewhere, but... He shrugs. I must make the time for a thorough stock take. And so I think at that point we have done some research in the library and we have learned a little bit about this festival. And we're pretty far into this episode, so we will stop here and we will continue with this story in the next episode. Until next time, I am Scrapperlock, and this has been Call of Cthulhu.